Hello again. My name is Panu and I'm converting this sailboat into electric one. This small series of videos I've been installing the motor, converting the sail drive, the fit and motor and doing the electric work. However, this channel is all about designing and building this 50-foot liveaboard sailboat. So if you're interested in this subject, please subscribe, hit that bell as well, so you get, get notified when new videos come. Before we start, I want to make an announcement that I have a naval architect. So the Arctic Sea Camel project is taking a huge leap forward and uh, I'm getting designing the boat this summer. The designer is an American chap called Vemari de Tanton. And if you are into sailboats, you may notice the name. He's been designing boats for decades and is very experienced with this kind of cat catch rigging. Actually, there has been a whole bunch of boats named after him, which all have this kind of carbon fiber mast. The model I'm looking for here is this. It's called Millennium Falcon, 50 foot steel boat that Mr. Tonton has agreed to make a wood epoxy version for me. In a few days, I'm going to get a digital model of this boat and then I'm going to look how my plan works in this hull. So I'm very excited that the project is moving forward now. There is also an option that if this particular hull doesn't work, there might be other hull designs available as well for me to choose from. But yeah, let's get into this video. It came a little bit long, there's a whole lot of stuff going on and I made chapters down below from which area you're interested in. Mostly it's all about wiring, how I did the wires and uh, lugs and stuff like that. So I've been concentrating of doing this electrical stuff for a couple of days and uh, things happened inside here as well, off camera. I painted this surface for mounting these. And I also painted this main bulkhead so I could fix these lights there permanently. So I've been doing a lot of work off camera and uh, now these stuff are properly fixed there and I did the first wires. So this is the main fuse and the batteries would connect on that side and, and there it is main switch and then it goes to the conductor and I will also make a separate wire from here to this power supply. From the conductor there's a wire fixed in place into this motor controller. This is the positive side and the negative goes from that end into the shunt. So the batteries will connect negative on that side and the positive on that side. Let's continue by doing some wiring. The main goal now is to make this motor controller work. We need to do a couple of things for that. First of all, we have to connect this contactor with the switch to turn it on. Then we need to connect things to that motor controller. And the wiring harness is here. So we're not going to use all of these, but we need to use some of them. The most important one is obviously this one, which is the throttle, and we need to connect this potentiometer. Then there is a second we're going to connect is this reverse control. This is going to be just a simple switch on the cockpit as well. And we'll see how this actually works with the sail drawing. And the third one we are going to connect the e-lock. So it's basically a lock switch. This one, and I'll connect this into this connector and uh, without turning the key, the motor controller will, will not turn on. So we have three things to turn on to get this motor work. The contactor, the key and the throttle. Let's start with the potentiometer cables. These are soldering connectors, so I have to solder wire. I already started, but my soldering iron broke and it didn't heat up this well enough, so I had to buy a new soldering iron today. So, One thing about soldering, I've been doing quite a bit of research of connecting things and uh, it was actually quite a lot of work to figure out how should I really connect 
all these cables. So this cable is the original one that came with the motor controller. So this is a badly crimped connector and it has been soldered. Here you can maybe see the problem with these, with soldered connections. If the wire gets moving, you can see the solder has penetrated inside the sleeve here. And if I move this wire, it will bend sharply from this position. If we continue doing like this, it will eventually break from here. So the problem is that the solder doesn't really flex at all. It's totally fixed. I cannot move this and it will break at some point. So that's why I'm going to go purely crimped connectors. So this is the one of the first connectors I did. And uh, there's basically uh, this kind of plug. And this is a tinned copper. And it's proper size for this wire. So it's very tight fit to put the cable the here, in here. And then I whack the connector with this kind of tool. So you put the connector down there and then you hit with the hammer for a few times and it crimps the connector around the wire and it's very very solid connection. It basically becomes one part and it flexes all the way back into that connector end. So there's no hard spot there. So we'll, it will last for a long time. In addition to that I put this heat shrink around it and this heat shrink I bought quite a bunch. It is the type that has glue inside so with this kind of connection it's airtight, moisture tight and the water cannot get into the wire and that is very important in boats. You don't want any moisture to get in this copper wire because it will affect corrosion in here. This is so much better than the old one. And his, it has these fancy lights, which will flicker in the video, but... Whoa. It's a bit too thick wire for this. It, this is not really designed for this purpose, this potentiometer, but it was the biggest one I found and it's waterproof. So I think we'll, it will do the job. And now we'll put some heat shrink above those connections. I don't have any heat gun here, so I'll just use the soldering iron. I have to be a little, little careful not to overheat it. Okay, here we go. It's not very pretty. The iron is a little bit too hot. Take a look at the other end. So this is the throttle. So with this tiny thing I can manage the motor. This will come eventually at the cockpit. I did this to, on purpose because I want to put some connectors back here so I can easily change this later on if needed. I'll put some connectors back here. I did quite a bit of research and uh, I decided to go with non-insulated models so I can put and wrap the heat shrink properly to all these wires to keep the moisture away from the copper wire itself. So you can get these connectors in many forms that has this sleeve in here. You just crimp them on top of that sleeve. But uh, if you can imagine you got this sleeve on here, you put the wire in here and then you crimp it, the end of the copper will still be visible. So I don't want to do that, but I want to properly seal these copper wire ends. So that's why I bought these non-insulated ones and uh, this crimping tool. So there are different tools for different kind of connectors and this is meant for these non-insulated ones. So first let's rip up some of the sleeve here and uh, okay here you can see it's a little bit too long. These longer wings should be on the wire sleeve and these shorter ones should crimp around this wire and the wire shouldn't be much longer than that so I have to shorten the wire just a little bit. 
now it looks okay. Then we take this crimping tool. It has a few options. I think this one is the middle one. The longer wings go on the deeper hole like that. It stays there. And the shorter ones are on the, this side. So now we'll put the wire in here so that the sleeve is on the longer wings and then we just push and hope for the best. Okay, there is this one problem. If the longer sleeve doesn't start to bend correctly in there, it can be quite hard to keep it going. So let's see how, what happens here. Okay, some problems. The other wing broke off, so it didn't come perfectly. But the crimp for the actual wire looks perfect. So this is really tight connection. You can't really pull this off. In this case, I think it's, it's okay. I don't need that. Another wing. Okay, let's put the next one on the bigger slot if it works better. Okay, it didn't. It was too big. This is not a good connection. You can see the difference of the wings. This went properly. And there you can see the copper wire. Maybe I'll crimp it again with the smaller one. Okay, it helped. Much better. Very tight. I think that will do. I think this tool, this wasn't the expensive one. This, is, this was quite cheap, so there might be better tools for doing this. But there is like this much of these connections in this boat, so... I think it will do for me. If I were doing these like hundreds, I would definitely buy a better one. And you need quite a bit of force with this one. Okay, let's now put the heat shrink onto these. And uh, now I think it's very important to get the heat shrink over the copper wire like this. And then I'll put a second heat shrink over this connector so that when this gets connected, it will protect this actual connector. I'm not really a fan of these connectors in boat usage because there is possibility that they pull off by themselves or accidentally. This is one of the reasons I didn't want the copper to come really far because otherwise this heat shrink wouldn't go over the copper. Okay, now they're all wrapped up. Now we'll put the second heat shrink one size larger over this whole thing. So here you can see the glue coming from the end of the heat shrink. Like so. Here we have three connectors all wrapped up and ready. So if the thicker wires were done with lugs like this and uh, some of the thin wires were done with these ones with the grimping tool. The third one, the most common one I'm going to use is this one uh, with different options on the sizes but it's basically just a rim around the wire and it will be crimped. Most simple and cheapest tool I have, so old crimping tools that doesn't work as wire cutter or anything, but I noticed that with these connectors these work actually great. So it just goes like that in there and then there is this this part so you can't see, but there's actually a seam just on the upper side. So this should be down side there. So this notch pushes the other side, not this side with the seam. Now the wire is on there and will push really hard. 
and then we do another one right next to the first one so and that's it it's very sturdy i can't pull it yeah very good connection with very cheap tools and now i can <clears throat> cut this off and put the <laughs> heat shrink there first <laughs> yep so I have many different sizes of these connectors with the uh, round connector and uh, and we also have this kind of fork shaped connectors all the grimping sides are the same but yeah, this is the way to go. You can get good crimp here and then you can get the heat shrink with glue all over the grimp and it will be gas tight and no moisture can get into this copper wire, which is the important part. Most of the main components are now wired up. It's a bit of mess right now. I haven't yet attached these to anything. So I'll, I'll put some neat little wire holders like these. And if we take a look at this side, this is the motor controller, it's all wired up and the conductor is wired up and the 12 volt power supply is wired up and there's also a couple of fuses wired in there. I realized when wiring that conductor that there was no fuse before it. I had a couple of extra fuse places here so I wired it up through this fuse box. And on the other side we have the ground cable for the 12 volt power supply and the ground cable for the motor controller. And uh, yesterday evening with my son who's 16 and a strong we took all the batteries to the boat so here we have all the all four batteries in position and uh, there's going to be covers on them and then they will be strapped down with this kind of strap. So the plan tonight is to make the cable for the batteries and uh, cable for this potentiometer to the motor controller. After these two the motor side should be in working order. After that there's just the 12 volt system to wire up. I already did the power supply cables for this and I have to add one fuse between here. Uh, it is kind of a main fuse for the 12 volt system. But let's take a look how I did those bigger cables and let's start with the battery cable. First of all, I have to say that it's unbelievable how big of a mess one guy can create in one night. Okay, looking much better now. So, if we start with the negative main battery cable. This is the pos positive one. And here's the negative. Main negative on the battery will be the smaller one. And it's 8 millimeter lug. The other end of that battery monitor is 10 millimeter lug. So we have to make a cable that fits there. You maybe can see there this stamp that it's 2510. So 25 is the cross section of the cable in square millimeters, and 10 is the size of this hole. So this one is 258. First, let's measure up length of the cable. So I measure that I need. Like this is about maybe 60 centimeters of the cable. Uh, the first lesson I learned was that if you are going to deal with these thick cables, you have to buy a proper wire cutter tool. And this is not a proper wire cutter tool. This was actually quite expensive. But if we try to cut the wire, you can see that it doesn't hold up. And this is just a piece of crap. It doesn't do a proper job. It's sharp, all right, but it won't hold itself together. As a do-it-yourself guy, I invented a workaround. So let's take a clamp and squeeze this up so that it holds together. You can still move it and let's try to make another cut here. Like so. Lesson learned. If you do a lot of big cables, get a good tools. Another tool I don't have is the proper thick wire sleeve cutter. So I'm going to use the same tool 
these are quite sharp and this is a kind of sleeve that cuts quite easily. So first I measure that I will cut the proper length and I carefully keep my fingers in here and carefully make a cut so that it doesn't go all the way through for the copper so we don't cut any of those copper wires. Okay, here we go. No loose wires there. Now this is a bit tricky part to get all the copper wires inside this lug. <laughs> that went surprisingly easy. Okay, now you can maybe see the copper wires from that end. So they should be all the way to the end of this lug. So the wire is fully in there, so there's no void. And now we take this doohickey, which is a hammer operated crimping tool. So now I have to change position because I can't use this table, it's a little unstable. So, so this step here is stable enough and I use this scrap piece of plywood underneath. So now I place the lug carefully under this tool and uh, make sure that it's properly on its place and make sure that the wire is properly secured when it's on the position I'll hit a couple of time, times with decent amount of force okay and now we learned another lesson it it was a little bit loose here, so it's not properly there. So we have to redo this. Okay, I did a new cut, a new lug, and let's try this again. So one hit, and then we check the position. Yep, now it's well in there, and uh, then we make a few more hits. And just the tip, use the hearing protection. Okay, now the lug is crimped and it's rock solid, you can't get it out. Okay, after crimping, now we have a proper connection between the lug and the wire. And uh, next we are going to make this gas tight. So, I have this large enough heat shrink and uh, then we measure up the heat shrink long enough like so and then we put it over the lug and the wire what we want to do here is to cover this hole and cover this joint here so we'll put it over the lug like that and uh, now we heat it up we don't want to burn the heat shrink just to heat it up so it, it shrinks properly. And this end is quite important. You should see the glue to come up just a bit on the edge. I don't know if you can see it on camera, but there's a slightly bright little like a reflection of the glue in just in there. And uh, it tells that the glue has melted uh, as well and it has been attached to this lug. Same thing on this end. You should make sure that the glue is activated from the heat. Now it seems to be ready. Here we have a proper grimped connection and the heat shrink around it. And uh, now I'll do the other end with this 10 millimeter. Here we have the first negative side cable ready. This way I'll do rest of the cables. Now I'll continue off camera and uh, we'll see the end result soon. Okay, it's a couple of hours later and uh, all the battery cables are done and they are also installed except for this last cable that going the main negative to the battery monitor. So when I connect that, the battery monitor should turn on. I also connected the charger uh, cable. It goes to the main positive here and to the battery monitor shunt negative here. So. Before I connect that, I want to check with the meter that the voltage is correct and, and everything is well connected. 
So we should find the main positive here and uh, main negative on this battery terminal. Let's see what it says. Yep, 50.2 volts. Everything's connected and voltage is right. So, last piece of cable here and connect it to that battery. Okay, there was some some power there. Oh, I think it's, it was from the charger. Something happens. Let's see if, if it's anything good. You should be a little careful with these tools now because even though it's just 48 volts, there's plenty of power here, so no sudden moves. Okay. Now it's all connected and we should have power when I turn the main switch on. I'm a little excited right now. Before I do that, I want to turn on the battery monitor. So this is the wire that comes from the battery monitor shunt to the, this display. So the display lo is located here and this wire will connect back there. Yep, it turned on. I think I should have now this manual to set up the proper ca battery capacity. So I got the manual here and let's see the first setup. It says that factory settings are suitable for lead acid battery. It will automatically detect the voltage. So I don't have to change anything for this system. If I had lithium ion, I would ch have to change some settings. Now it says 200 amp hours and we got 100 amp hours of lead acid so that's good now we set up 100 okay now it should be set up okay it shows that there is 50.42 volts and uh, battery is full so these are brand new batteries that have never been used it should be now okay now let's try to put the charger here's the charger Inlet and I have outlet here. Okay, it's now connected to the mains and uh, now we put the, it on and hope that nothing explodes. It turned on. That's great. The fan is on in here. We can see that it's 53.9 volts, 54. So it's definitely charging now. How cool is this? It works, everything seems to be okay. 55 volt and rising. Well, here we can see it's charging by 6 amps. So that charger is 6 amp charger. So it works as it should be. How cool is this? 350 watts. Okay, the amp hour meter is zero. Battery capacity shows 100%. Okay, the charging voltage is quite high. I will keep eye on this. How freaking cool is this? It works! <laughs> I'm so happy guy right now. Yeah. So I li I leave it now charging and uh, let's see. It should be automatic charger and when the uh, batteries are full it should be going on float mode. So that voltage should drop. Uh, one thing I didn't mention. Uh, I measured all the batteries before I connected them, so they are on the same voltage. It's very important that you charge the batteries, or in this case they are new, uh, at the same level before you connect them in the series, because if one of them is lower than the other ones, they can damage each other. So I'm starting to clean up all this mess right now and uh, maybe make a couple of more wires or something. and. Uh, Let's get on with this, with the motor and rest of the stuff. Thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you on the next video, which is all about installing the sail drive testing. And please subscribe if you haven't already. There's still 
quite a bunch missing from the thousand subscribers, which is the YouTube magical number. Leave me a thumbs up and ask anything regarding this project or the big boat. I try to answer as best I, as I can in this point. I'm really looking forward to see this channel to grow in a point where it will support itself and we can get more quality content for you guys. And don't forget, you can also support the project by ordering these amazing hoodies or t-shirts and uh, all this revenue will go into these projects. And if you are visiting Finland, this boat is now available for charter in the evening sales. So please contact me if you're interested to take a look at this amazing scenery that has no match anywhere in the world. So welcome! Remember to subscribe, leave a like and uh, we'll see you on the next video. Bye!